Hugs, not drugs. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. This geezer is having an orgasm. <laughs> That was officially awesome. So after lockdown 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, crazy quarantines, serious amounts of coffee, we are back on the road for the disruptive entrepreneur. I'm feeling amazing. The sun is out, Kieran's guns are out, the coffee is out, and the boys are out, and we are on tour. So I'm Rob Moore, the Disruptive Entrepreneur. I'm host of the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. We've interviewed some of the most amazing people on the planet. I've written 18 books. I run multiple companies and have multiple um, real estate portfolio interests, property. So we're going to see my friend Ronnie, Ronnie O'Sullivan. I've got to know him really well. I'm the best snooker player that's ever lived, fact. He likes to talk about running and business and real estate because they're his favorite subjects. But of course, we've got to talk about his legacy as the best snooker player in the world, and if he thinks he is. He's done some rather quirky individual things, like some disruptive interviews and sort of being a bit critical of maybe other snooker players or the governing body, shall we say. Actually, he's been quite critical of someone who we know well, um, who we interviewed on The Disruptive Entrepreneur, who we're interviewing again. So probably I'm going to have to go to those places. Yeah, we've interviewed a lot of people on Zoom since 18 months ago when we were last on the road. It's not the same. Like before the pandemic, I didn't want to do any Zoom interviews. They're not the same. But of course, if you can't travel, you can't travel and Zoom's better than nothing. But now that we can travel face to face, baby. The greatest challenge I've had to overcome in the past year is the global pandemic of fear could be seen as greater than the global pandemic of the virus itself. Why? Because fear kills more dreams than anything else does. And when you can smell everyone's fear, feel and sense everyone's fear, it can be hard to inoculate yourself from that fear and focus on your vision and your mission, your goals and your dreams. What's the best thing about your job? The best thing about my job is it's not a job. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> the best thing about my job is it's not a job. I get to love what I do and do what I love. Turn my passion into profession. Turn my impact into income. Yeah, it's not, look, it's work, but I actually find work very rewarding. Too many people are like, oh, I just want to do less. I want to do more. Too many people are, oh, I just want an easier life. I want a harder life. Too many people are like, oh, I want more freedom. I want more accountability. Because there is no sweeter feeling than achieving something meaningful. And we have this naive fantasy that when we don't have to do anything, when we've got no responsibility, then life will be sweet. But then we are bored and then we are restless and then we have nothing to overcome and life becomes boring and empty. So we need constant challenges do things that are meaningful, serve, solve, and scale. What is passive income and you create it? Passive income is income from assets where the time has already been exchanged and you get the ongoing recurring benefit. You create passive income by building assets that are systemizable, processable, and scalable. If you were to ask me what's more powerful, knowledge or money, I would have to say knowledge because it's knowledge that attracts money. Now, when you have money, don't get me wrong, you have power, but you need knowledge to attract money in the first place. Knowledge always trumps money. Three ways to get out of debt fast. Number one, go find an entrepreneur, go offer to work for them for free for 30 or 60 days when they see how hard you hustle, cut a deal with them whereby they'll give you a commission on sales you make or on ideas that you bring to the company that can make them revenue. The second way is set up an e-commerce store, sell products and services online, especially information, mentoring, masterminds, online courses, turn what you've learned into cash. The third way is to create joint ventures and collaborations. Go to people with money and audience and followers with an idea that could make them money and cut a deal as a joint venture collaboration. <laughs> Sorry, just quick. This is what kids are like. Oh. No, 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 it's like, bro, <laughs> wow, sick, dude, that's how you guys talk now. <laughs> Honestly, this, this is what, 
27 year olds like we've got the most amazing language english it has the most words out of any other language so descriptive and beautiful and historic and the kids are like bro dude yo i am old 42 years old like i remember pre-internet I bet you don't. Do you remember dial-up? You don't remember dial-up. Vaguely. I remember the noise of dial-up. Yeah. But the thing is, like for dating, for example, you never had this. You can just swipe, 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 swipe. But when you went on a dating app, yeah. when you were um, on dial-up, you had to wait 10 minutes for the photo to load up. <laughs> ah, sitting here for 20 minutes. I hope she's good looking. I hope, I hope she's good looking. She hot, she and now you're just she like, hot, bin, hot, bin, 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 bin. My thought process before an interview, I was actually just thinking, if I'm not a little bit nervous, then the questions aren't edgy enough. And I'm thinking, oh, is this, should I take that one out? Oh, should I take that one out? Should I make it a bit more soft and cuddly? But if there isn't that potential edginess in an interview, then maybe I'm not pushing myself enough. And I was having a conversation with one of my friends yesterday about the meaning of life. And whether there's something after we die or not, once it's gone, it's gone. So you gotta freaking live while you're alive. And it's all about experiences. I'm going to take more risks with the questions. And uh, that's my thought process before an interview. Is it exciting footage watching me do it my shoelaces? Is this what goes viral? Is the acoustics all right in here? Ronnie, how you doing? How you doing, Troy? Did you walk? No, I told you. Oh, okay. How you doing? Are you close, or? Yeah, like three or four minutes. Yeah. yeah. I thought it'd better come in and they could just make us teas, coffees, chill out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You've had an all-nighter at your, your house. That's the honest truth, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I do some of my podcast interviews on Zoom if I can't get to America. I interviewed Floyd Mayweather last week. Oh, okay. You're fucking hard, man. And Floyd? Yeah. What hard as in what? What would you say has been your greatest fight of all time? All of them. I'd normally prepare about 12 to 15 questions for yeah, someone. Yeah. And some people, I would not even get all them done. Yeah. And we had 19 for him. Yeah. And I, I slipped four in at the end. Yeah. And it was done in 23 minutes. No, it was not, yeah, 23 minutes, 29 questions I asked him. Really? Yeah. So what, just short, bang, bang, bang? Yeah, it, yeah, like, who are you going to fight next? Logan Paul. Who after Logan Paul? Logan Paul. Who after who after Logan Paul? Yeah. Logan Paul. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rob, can you just count to five, please? One billion, two billion, three billion, four billion, five billion. Three pounds, four pounds, five pounds, <laughs> six pounds, seven pounds, eight pounds. <laughs> did, I, did I see you driving McLaren? Have you, did you have the McLaren? No, I've never, I, I've tried. I've test drive them. I don't like them. Don't like them. That's what my mate said. They're very bland. Really? Yeah, not exciting, not, not, I don't like the note of the, yeah. the sound. Yeah. I mean, obviously they're good cars, but no, I, I had a few years ago, I had a 458 and I tried the McLaren version. Definitely the Ferrari was a lot better. A lot better, yeah. Actually, having had the Aventador, the Ferrari is actually almost quite drivable every day. The 458 and the 488. I had the 430, I bought that like 12 years ago. Yeah. That wasn't as every day. Right, okay. You know, big <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the 458 four, and 488 are better. Yeah. Didn't like the McLarens. So. Yeah, let's get a, a sync. Cool. Yeah. One take, one mark. Ronnie, thanks for the, doing the interview. No, great to be here, Rob, you know. Um, yeah, it's been good getting to know you and through Pete Cohen and stuff like that. So, yeah, find, finally we meet and get to chat. Yeah, likewise. So can you give us a bit of a flavour for the demands that snooker puts on you? Yeah, because it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a lonely sport, you know. You're, uh, you're on the road a lot. It's, 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 it's a really, it's quite a technical sport as well. When you're sitting in your chair and your opponent's at the table, there is nothing you can do. So you have a lot of time to think, you know. And, and it's, how, it's what you do with that thinking time which 
kind of determines how you do when you do eventually get back to the table. But when I started to work with Ray Reardon and learn the defensive side of the game, I started to win them matches. So now I'm, I'm getting through this game first, I'm still here Friday. And, and then I started to win a lot more tournaments. And, um, but it's like I had to learn another side of the game, which I didn't really, I would never have appreciated because I just didn't know how to play that defensive game, you know, uh, and John Higgins did. So he, he was more gifted as, a, you know, he was the complete pro even at 14. Um, me, I was just a potter. Um, but just being a potter isn't enough to, to, to dom dominate your sport, no matter how good a potter you are, because mm. some days they just don't go in. <laughs> So I understand from our research that you have struggled when you were younger with a bit of depression. Mm. So first off, is that true? Mm. And then if it is, how did you beat the demons? I always call it snooker depression. Um, and when I was younger, um, I used to just love the game. And obviously I'd get down on myself if I didn't play well. Um, but then I think when I got to about 18, 17, 18, I kind of started to, to get a lot of doubt and started to compare myself to, say, someone like John Higgins. And I used to look at John Higgins and think, I wish I could play snooker like him, you know, he's just like the perfect player. He had everything, great temperament, great technique, great scoring, great safety. And I thought, how am I going to stay with this guy for the next, like, 30, 30 years? You know, this geezer is an animal on a snooker table. You know, we all knew how good John Higgins was when he was 14. And, um, you know, and I always had the dream that I wanted to be like Steve Davis, I wanted to be this like serial winner of like multiple world championships, and I thought this isn't going to happen because I've got John Higgins in my way. <laughs> 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 Can someone just get rid of him, please? <laughs> Make my life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't going to happen, so I kind of had to like improve, if you like. You know, the game that I come in as a professional wasn't good enough. Is there anything you could say to anyone so that they don't spend their prime years on the floor? Yeah, I just think, um, oh, I said, you know, I had five years there where I just went missing and, and I had another two years where I went missing. So in a way, I've like, although I've been a pro 30 years, I'd probably only say I've been present in about 20, 20, 20 of them. <laughs> I've had seven, eight, nine, ten years where I've kind of just, just not been, been on, been on the, just been there really. Just, I've been there, but I haven't been there. And I just think for any young person coming through you know I that pe when people go oh, if I had my time over again I'd, 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 I wouldn't change anything I'm like really I'd change so many things so many things and uh, I just think I would just I would just I think my dad going away fucked me up really um, and and it's a shame really because I think he he was my anchor and if I was being naughty he would quickly put me in line when he went away, I just thought, fuck, I've got no one to put me in line here. I can just do what I like when I like. I had a bit of money, no one, no one could tell me what to do. Did you at one point get quite into, was it Buddhism? Yeah. What got you into that and how did that help you? I think uh, the, 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 what kind of got me into that was I went into a rehab, I think it was in 2000. Um, yeah, I was having some problems with drinking and smoking a bit of dope at the time and stuff like that. And uh, I kind of got to a point where it wasn't fun. It wasn't really giving me the release that it did when I first started. And I kind of thought, I need to really knock this on the head because obviously, you know, I was getting drug tested quite a lot as a player. And I thought, you know, this, this dope stays in the system for like 30 days, you know. So like, I was starting to have to miss tournaments, miss events, just because I thought I might get tested. And I'd rather not play than get tested again <laughs> for cannabis because I got done once for yeah. it. And uh, so I was kind of like, I, was, I thought, I'm screwed here. <laughs> Unless I find a way to get off this weed and this beer, I'm like, you know, maybe it's time to retire. And I was like, I was only like 24. And I thought, what else am I going to do in my time? I, I only know how to play snooker. It's not like I could um, go and do anything else. So uh, I, I stuck myself in, well, I didn't stick myself in, into a rehab. Somebody else did. I thought, that's a bit harsh, though, you know. Like, I thought that was for hardcore addicts, you know. And um, But for me, it was probably the best thing I've ever done, you know. So I got a month off of everything, came out, and um, and I've never looked back. So would you ever, like, try less hard in a match to help you go out? Well, I would kind of it was more of like a subconscious thing, yeah. So, like, I kind of think, well, like, quarters is enough. Semis is, don't get to the final. <laughs> don't get to the final, because you don't want to lose finals. Semis, you don't really, that's not a nice match to lose because you're one away from the final. 
quarters is not a bad place to lose. In an interview with the BBC, Ronnie, the quote, if you look at the younger players coming through, they're not that good really. Most of them would do well as half decent amateurs, but not even amateurs, they are so bad. Was that something you said in emotion or did you mean that and what did you mean? Yeah, I just, do you know what it is? Is I kind of look around and I just think, where's the next crop of players coming through? And I think, well, when I was a kid, you know, you, you kind of like, you dedicated your life to just playing snooker. Whereas a lot of them now, they're on their phones, they're having a laugh, they're chatting with their mate, they're hitting a few balls. And I just think there's no quality in their, in their, in their, in their preparation. You know, and I, and I used to be like that a little bit, not a lot. But now and again, and, I, and, I, and, I, and it wouldn't feel right. But these guys are doing it every day of the week. And I'm like, you, you can't become a, a brilliant at what you do if you're approaching your practice like that. What you want to practice like that, you want to live your life like that. And then when it comes to playing the match, you want to then become serious and you want to become disciplined. And it just doesn't, it's not like turning a tap on. It's like you have to train yourself in practice and in your preparation to be able to perform in the match. So it becomes like second nature. Have you ever been offered like a, a bribe? Is max, match fixing a big thing? Yeah, years ago, someone said to me, oh, I need to meet you. And he's the sort of guy you don't want to get on the wrong side of. And I was like, because you were a people pleaser, you said yes. I went, yeah, of course. And he was a friend, you know. I, yeah. I, I've, I've, you know, over the years you meet people and, you know, um, obviously like where my dad has been, I've kind of got, everywhere I go, oh, I spent five years with your dad. And he's like, Lunatic, basically. I'm like, oh, how are you doing? Yeah, my dad spoke about it. He said, you're a really lovely guy. He said, anytime you're here, anytime you're here, I'll do that for you. Don't worry. And I'm like, okay. So I've got, I've got uncles everywhere. <laughs> and um, yeah, so like one guy, if I met, he said, Nick, Nick want to have a meet with you over the forest. And I thought, oh shit, what have I done now? And then we went for a little walk and he went, you know, does he ever I went, nah, mate. I said, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I said, I couldn't do it. I said, my career would be over. I said, I just, I, and, and plus, I just, it's not in me. I said, I don't, I don't play snooker for money. I'm not interested in it. I just, I just feel so dirty. So when we were researching, obviously we find all these interviews with you putting on an Australian accent, yeah, yeah. making noises, just doing one word answers yeah, yeah, and yeah, grunts yeah. and yeah, things. Yeah, and I'm yeah. thinking, oh, Ronnie doesn't do that for me. No. Tell us about those sort of random interviews I'm where you clearly weren't asked. I'm actually really good, you know, when I'm talking to people, I really like to, I like to give values. So yeah, when I'm this, snooker, is, this is great, when by I give, the way. When I go snooker, I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I just want to get this done, dust and get out there. I'm thinking, it's so important to me that every person that's come here to watch goes away thinking, that was magic. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I'm here to do is provide, you know. I might be a bit quiet when I do mix, you know, I'm not like Dennis Taylor giving loads of gags, but what I am going to do is I'm going to put on a performance where you go, I've played this game. Fucking hell, that's unbelievable. And, he, and they're nudging their mate, you yeah. see? And, I, uh, and that's what I get joy out of. So I like to give like value. Even in my interviews, I'm like, you know what? I can sit here and be a bit cagey, but I'm not a cagey person. So I like to be open. But with that openness, one day I'm going to feel like shit. And that openness is going to sound really shit. And I'm going to say stuff that people are going to go, why does he say that? But I just think you can't have the good without having the bad. You can have the robot. The robot's never going to put a foot wrong. Mm. You can have the Australian. He's going to be so upbeat, <laughs> right? Because Australians are upbeat. You can have the scarcer, because they're really funny and they can make... But I'm like me, and, I, and, and, and when I talk like me, I can be very positive, very upbeat, but I can be very down on myself as well. And what I really struggled with was, uh, was at the snooker was is that I would do like something and I'd get a letter or an email every week. You've done this. And they'd use certain words which were quite threatening. And I'd take it quite personally. I'd think, you know what, I've, I've been a naughty boy here. And then in the end, I started to get, I started to monitor my own behaviour. And I thought, I'm not really doing a lot wrong. I'm just saying how I feel. And if saying what I feel is really bad, then maybe I shouldn't play snooker no more. But I love snooker. You've called Barry Hearn's management of snooker a dictatorship. Um, do you think things can change? Uh, probably not. But I understand why he does what he does and the way he runs his business. And I think he enjoys sort of like the thought that people are dependent on him, you know, that they feel like they've got nowhere to go. It's like, I, this, is my, this is what I'm putting on offer and you're only going to play for me and you're not going to be able to do it and you've got to get permission from me to do anything. And I think he kind of enjoys that he's got people under that sort of, in that place, if you like, and that would never work for me. 
So this has been The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Thanks for tuning in, everyone on the lives, Facebook, Instagram, Ronnie's, mine, everyone listening or watching. This has, for me, been an awesome experience. Yeah. And I always can tell looking at these guys. I often just look at, because they come on Kieran and Harry, yeah. been across 160 odd interviews. Yeah. And I always just get a little look. We're going to go and have a little giggle in the oh. car now about how great this is. <laughs> there we are. Um, if there was a burger and lobster here, we'd be celebrating right uh, now, wouldn't we? Uh, um, this has been absolutely brilliant, Ronnie. No, I've loved it. I've Thank loved you very it. much. I'd shake your hand if we were allowed, but I'll get sued for that probably. Cool. But, and you'll get a letter from World Snooker. Oh, <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ronnie. Really Lovely. Top man. It. Thanks, Rob. Cheers, boys. Thank you. That was brilliant. Yeah, is that Thanks right? Yeah, Did yeah. you enjoy it? Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I good. thought it was good. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's good. You're yeah. good, isn't you? Thank you. You're like a pro, isn't you? Oh, I didn't really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you've done 165. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not like. No, you're good. Mainstream press, no, kind of. No, oh, you're good. Because it's not easy to do what you do. Because I've tried it and it's sort of like. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's an art to it, you know what I mean? And I'll, be, I'll come up to, yeah. to see you in... Um, I know, know you're busy free. and I've got time. Oh, I'll make time. Yeah, I've got time on my hands at the moment, so I'm able to just... Let me know when you're free. Jump in the car. You'll love this place to take you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A bit yeah. of lunch, yeah. yeah. Do a little bit... Um, we'll go in the Atom. You, yeah, that, that's fine. All right, sounds good. Oh, yeah, the car. Yeah, yeah I'd love to, yeah. Is it two, it's two-seater, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But it sticks to the road like... Yeah, it does. Oh. Scares people, makes them yeah. cry. Yeah. <laughs> Your story gets a lot of views on Instagram. Does it? Yeah. My stories? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, a lot. Does it? <laughs> yeah, I was like, Because oh you look at God. all the engagement percentages, don't you? Yeah. It's you look at it in a different way to me. High. Is like, it? Really yeah, that's what a lot high. of people say, yeah. Okay, cool. Are we all right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah you're fine. Hugs, not drugs. So me, and then <laughs> perfect. I'm going to just get one in portrait as well. You're a lot taller than I thought. <laughs> How tall are you? Six three. Yeah, six three, yeah. Should have been a light heavyweight boxer. Yeah, if I could actually punch. <laughs> yeah. Do you do a bit of training to keep yourself fit? I used you look, to. You look in shape. Yeah, yeah I used to do cool. quite a bit of martial arts. Did I got you? A couple of brown belts. Yeah. Yeah, but that was t up till sort of 26. Okay. When I started business, I sort of took over. Yeah. It does doesn't it? Ruled like my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's a good thing though. Yeah, it's all the grey and the yeah, but it's wrinkles. Good, it? it's yeah, good no, good I love it. it. Yeah, that's right. Love yeah. it. You get more of a buzz from that. I always like in, in being in business. You get a chance to be like for me. It's like if someone says to me. You'd be golf for the next two years. I'd be like, yeah, great. And I'm going to do boxing for two years, still get paid for it. I'd be like, great. I'll try a bit of athletics for two or three years. <laughs> but in sport, you can't. No. You kind of like. You never get good enough. Well, you're, just, you're good at one thing. Yeah. Whereas in you, you can kind of transfer your skills into property, podcasting. That's true, actually. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, bit social bar, media. I you, you was in the art world, you go, oh, yeah. you get a gallery, get this, and all of a sudden you're like, yeah. you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a good skill to have. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I do. That's what I'm trying to say to my daughter. You know, she's panicking about school. So just. Just look at life as opportunity, just see opportunities, mm. you know what I mean? Just So do you want to get a bite to eat before you go? Is there somewhere yeah, you want to go? Yeah, is there somewhere? Yeah. That was officially awesome. I was a little bit, like, 10% nervous because Rodney's done some disruptive interviews, shall we say, that if you were the interviewer would be really uncomfortable. Like when he did an Australian accent or when he, when he just spoke like a robot. But it became apparent quite quickly in that this was just gonna be a fun and he was gonna answer anything. And he answered everything and it was great. You know, cause there was at times I knew I could contribute to the conversation with the Buddhism stuff, with him sort of fighting with depression and I didn't, get involved because I thought this is about Ronnie, not about me. I'm probably motivated a bit like Ronnie is, whereby if doubters or critics say something against you or someone says something that hurts, that can be really motivating. So yeah, I, I lost all of my weight because of the piss taking that I had. This interview for me in terms of enjoyment doing it and just the feeling of how awesome the person was, it's in the top five out of 160 odd, no doubt. Did I enjoy my time today with a really interesting person? It's like a 15 out of 10. Like if this was my last day on earth, that would be a, a brilliant way to spend the last day. We had all the chicken in Nando's, didn't we, afterwards to celebrate and we're back on the road 
we all agree that the live interviews are just infinitely better than the Zooms, even though we carried on doing the episodes through the Zooms, even though all of us kind of wanted to do live and we all agree that just the the connection, the questions, the depth, you just just don't get on the Zooms in the same way. So we're back on the road. The boys are back in the game. Check WhatsApp and see if there's anything that I need to respond to. I'll check my emails Friday afternoons. It's thankfully quite quiet for me. I've got some marketing reports to read. I'm not gonna be grafting at the back here like a laborer in the coal mines, but you know, I'll get a little bit of work done. It'll be fun. So if you enjoyed this, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell.